Um, ready? Yes, we are. It's January 15th. You're back with us at Give the People What They Want, the best weekly global news program on the internet with Prashant hey. and Zoe from People's Dispatch and me, Vijay, from Globetrotter. 15th of January, an important day. Today is the day, the assassination day of Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. We remember them fondly. We remember them in anger as well. Um, they were killed at the end of the, of the German Revolution. Um, Rosa Luxemburg fought for 30 years to try and ensure a revolutionary understanding in the social democratic movement. Karl Liebknecht, her comrade, both of them incidentally born in 1871. Her comrade Karl Liebknecht um, was the only member of the German parliament not to vote for World War I. These were very important people and we remember them with great fondness. On Sunday, January the 17th will be the 60th anniversary of the assassination of Patrice Lumumba, a great patriot of the Congo, a great, great patriot of Africa, working people around the world. Belgian colonialism, the CIA of the United States couldn't tolerate this large part of the world, the Congo, rich part of the world. They couldn't tolerate it being independent. And just at the moment of independence, in 1961, he was picked up. He was assassinated 60 years ago on Sunday. We remember Patrice Lumumba, Karl Liebknecht, Rosa Luxemburg with great fondness. Not so fond, Prashant, this week of a Supreme Court order that came out in India. Not so fond of it. Um, the Supreme Court decided to weigh in on the most significant global protest happening on the planet right now, the protest of Indian farmers. Supreme Court decided to wade in. This protest has been going since at least the 26th of November. What did the Supreme Court say, Prashant? Right, Vijay. So uh, this was a very unusual intervention because the aggrieved party, in this case, the farmers who are unhappy with the farm laws passed by the government. They've been protesting for over 50 days in the bitter cold amid the rain on the outskirts of Delhi. The farmers didn't want the Supreme Court to intervene. It was just some fringe groups, a couple of public interest petitions. And the Supreme Court approached the whole issue with a very paternalistic point of view. So they did give, uh, they did rap, give a rap on the knuckles of the government, say that, you know, you did not really do your job well. But at the end of the day, their solution to the problem, the farmers have been asking for the repeal of three farm laws. Their solution to the problem was to set up a committee. Now, the ironic thing about the committee was that the four members who were nominated to be part of the committee, all of these members are those who have taken supported the stance of the government favoring these laws. So just to remind our viewers, the farmers have been opposed, these, opposed to these laws because of the fact that one, they really fear this will drive down the prices that they're going to get for the produce. And in point number two, they fear that they will go, there's going to be greater corporate intervention in agriculture. So the big corporates are going to basically take over the whole agriculture sector. They're going to throw huge amounts of money. And at the end of the day, farm, farmers will be left with no bargaining power at all. So farmers across the country protesting very strongly on this. And when this went to the Supreme Court, the farmers have made their stand very clear that we want the repeal of the laws. And they're like, we want the government to talk to us and address this issue. Whereas the Supreme Court kind of waded in, uh, you know, gave some moralistic messages. In a very disturbing message, the Chief Justice observed that, you know, they may conclude that women and uh, older persons need not be there in the protest, which is, uh, which is quite, quite alarming because as P. Sainath, we'll come to him later, but P. Sainath said in an interview that women farm, form a huge number of the farmers of India. And when you say women should not be there in the protest, or when you say that old people who for decades have been doing agriculture, why should they not be there in the protest? So the Supreme Court actually approaching this whole process in a very, in a very problematic way. They, they just wanted the protest to continue. They were looking at it from the perspective of you know, law and order, and not really in terms of the issues which the farmers were facing. So uh, at the end of the day, what happens is that we have this committee. At least one member of the committee has recused himself. The other farmers are very unhappy. They said they're very clear that they're going to continue these protests. 
and their main protest plan is that on the 26th of January, they on the day, that's India's Republic Day, 26th of January, which marks the day when India's constitution was officially uh, adopted. So on the 26th of January, they are going to enter into Delhi on their tractors to make their point because they are very clear that they cannot be, you know, sort of shooed away with promises of bureaucratic procedures and committees. Their demand, the demands, that's it's one very interesting thing about this protest that the demands from day one have been very, very clear. So they're not, you know, there's been an amazing amount of unity, for instance, hundreds of farmers organizations across the country coming together on this platform, the government has tried to divide them, defame them, and yet they're united. They are determined that they are going to continue on these protests and we'll see what happens in the coming weeks, 26 January, a very important date for this reason. So that's where we are at right now. No, it's 26th of January is a landmark day. Of course, it's the day when the Indian constitution, um, you know, comes into effect in 1950. So such an important day. The farmers are picking up on that. People should go to newsclick.in. That's newsclick.in. Um, they are one of our partner organizations. Of course, you can continue to look at the coverage at People's Dispatch uh, as well. Um, the constitution, I mean, that's what they're going to pick up on. They say, let's march into Delhi on the day of the constitution because we have rights. <coughs> During this pandemic, so many countries have basically stripped people who are trying to fight for the good side of history of their rights. Um, we've seen this in Belgium, police violence. We've seen this in Denver, Colorado. Zoe, what's happening in these two cases broadly in the attack on people's rights? Yeah, um, Vijay, I'd first like to start by talking about the case of the comrades from Denver. Um, so I, if anyone was tuning in last night to the Breakthrough News live stream last night, they would have catch, caught a peek of a segment of an interview with the comrades from three members of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Uh, they were, I mean, I'm just going to start and kind of move backwards in the case. On September 17th, uh, three members of the party were arrested um, and slapped with insane charges kidnapping, um, you know, a couple of felonies, a couple of misdemeanors, all uh, adding up to around 60 years in prison. And so, okay, what are these party members doing? What are these, you know, leftist activists doing? They've been organizing on the front lines of um, protests in Denver and Aurora, Col Colorado, um, demanding justice for um, Elijah McClain, who was assassinated by the police uh, in August of 2019. Um, and I think, you know, speaking about kind of this crackdown on people who are fighting for justice, on the people who are demanding the most basic rights and human conditions of dignity, um, you know, amid the pandemic, but, you know, beyond that, because these are issues of um, racist police, um, racist policing, um, police brutality, um, and these organizers um, are, you know, facing 60 years in prison. Um, they're continuing to fight this case, and I think this the kind of contrast between the treatment that these organizers are getting who, you know, have organized peaceful demonstrations, sit-ins, mobilizations. I think a lot of people around the uprising in the United States probably saw images of this massive protest with violins because um, Elijah McClain, who was killed in August, was a violin player. And these organizers in Denver um, facing 60 years, whereas we see, of course, people uh, who stormed the Capitol, who sat in Nancy Pelosi's chair are facing you know, a couple years. Um, and I wanted to draw some attention to this case because, you know, as they're continuing to fight these charges, as they're continuing to kind of insist in their innocence, while also demanding justice for Elijah McClain, of course, the cops are still free. They have not been pressed with any charges. These organizers are the only people who have actually seen legal repercussion in the case of Elijah McClain. Um, tomorrow wanted to tip people off to a really important documentary release that's happening January 16th, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Breakthrough News is launching their documentary about the case. And I think it's, you know, a really important case to keep in mind and to highlight because as people across the world are resisting repression, are resisting, you know, attempts by states to crack down, uh, we need to be highlighting these cases and we need to be, um, you know, cognizant 
that in our struggles for justice, there are repercussions, but we have to fight back against them. And that the intended effects of these arrests, which is to demobilize the movements, demobilize people, intimidate them, threaten them, must not be had, and that we must continue to rise up. Um, I mean, in Belgium, what people are mobilizing against this week is that um, a 23-year-old man was killed in police custody. Um, this was on January 9th. And this has caused an outroar across Belgium. People have been on the streets um, demanding an end to racist uh, policing. And I think we see a continuation of the protests that happened this summer, because as we know, the death of, or the murder of George Floyd in May, um, of course, released, kind of unleashed a global rebellion. And so we're seeing protests this summer in the US, in France, in Australia. Um, against racist policing and people are continuing to mobilize against us. So we're seeing the protests in Belgium. We're seeing protests in Ireland as well against the um, brutal killing of a mentally ill man in um, outside of Dublin. Um, and of course, organizers are seeing backlash from this. So uh, definitely keep following these stories. Um, follow uh, the case of these Denver activists who are continuing to fight for justice for Elijah McLean and for their own innocence. Um, and we must continue to resist racist policing and demand that people who are committing these crimes, you know, be brought to justice. I suppose that's important. But uh, if we now leave the confines of Denver, Colorado, and go to Washington, D.C., where, as you mentioned, on January 6th, there was a sort of explosion of an American B-movie uh, into the halls of the Capitol. It looked like a fantasy science fiction thriller come to life being shot in real time didn't look real to most people not to me certainly never seen anything quite like this you know people dressed in furs and so on gallivanting through um, the capital it, it didn't look like a revolution it truly looked like a monty python film um, that being said mike pompeo has not um, you know uh, has not allowed himself to be constrained by the fact that by the time we come back to you with give the people what they want next week. By the time we come back to you, uh, Mr. Biden will be the president of the United States, not Mr. Trump any longer. Nonetheless, uh, Mr. Pompeo, the Secretary of State for Trump, has gone after um, the adversaries of the United States. And I, I want to be quite advised in the use of this term, not the adversaries of the Trump administration, because there is some unanimity in US foreign policy, gone after Iran, gone after China and gone after Cuba and Venezuela, because these are related. I just want to quickly explain what Pompeo has done, because I don't think this is being adequately covered. They quickly designated Ansar Allah, which is a group um, that, uh, you know, part of the, 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 the fight against Saudi Arabia is led by Ansar Allah group, largely but not entirely of the Houthi people of Yemen designated Ansar Allah a terrorist organization. Now, there's no appeal for this, you know, and it means a lot of things. One of them is it, it basically legitimizes the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, and Saudi war in Yemen. Uh, legitimizes it, makes it part of the war on terror. Secondly, for the first time in decades, the United States has said that U.S. diplomats can um, engage with Taiwanese diplomats uh, without any restrictions. This is a direct challenge to China. Um, this has happened again in the last few days. And then finally, the United States has started the process to designate Cuba as a state sponsor of terrorism. Now, Obama removed Cuba from that list. That's important to bear in mind. Um, by the way, Cuba is not designated already. You know, there's a process. They've started the process. It's actually not entirely clear that the United States is going to be able to complete the process in the last few days before Biden comes in. Uh, but the reason Pompeo gave for putting Cuba back on the list is very important. Because you see, there's no evidence that Cuba is involved in anything terroristic. In fact, um, what is Cuba involved in? It's involved in sending the Henry Brigade of, of medical doctors to help people fight the COVID epidemic. And of course, for which they should, I hope, um, win the Nobel Peace Prize uh, in the coming year. You know, and, and it's not a question of 
I've said this before, it's not a question of the Nobel Peace Prize being given to the Cuban doctors, it's the question of the Cuban doctors honoring that prize, which has seen its legitimacy decline. But what Pompeo said is that Cuba should return to this list because Cuba supports the government of Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela. I mean, they linked it directly. This is the last days, the burning down of the house of the United States government. You know, you've had these clowns running through the capital. And what do they do in their last days? In the last days, they ramp up pressure against Iran, China, Venezuela, destabilizing the world. Very dangerous people, I must say. And it's hard to report this without feeling a sense of the danger. Um, you know, I, I read carefully the Associate Press report, and I feel sometimes bad for the reporters at the AP, you know, because they have to write these things in a balanced way. And even the Associated Press reporter um, was not able to hold back. And I just want to give you what the, what the sub-editor offered as the headline. You know, the sub-editor headline for the AP, the headline was Yemen, China, Cuba, top Pompeo to-do list as time runs down. I thought that's, that is a good headline. Yemen, China, Cuba, top Pompeo to-do list as time runs down. Because time is running down, not just for Trump, but for, I think, U.S. authority. Uh, we got a taste of that, Prashant, a little taste of that on the African continent um, this week. There was an election in Uganda. You covered that, um, you know, closely. Uh, I say we got a taste of it because things are happening in Uganda that I think people should reflect on. Tell us a little bit about the election in Uganda. Absolutely, Vijay. It's actually one of the most significant in the continent because on the one hand, you have Yoweri Museveni, who has been in power for since 1986. And he's, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's a dictator. He's rigged multiple elections. There is ample proof of that. He controls all the levers of power. We were talking to Milton Alimadi, the founder and publisher of Black Star News, who gave a very powerful, a comprehensive picture. And one of the things he pointed out was how over the decades, uh, Museveni was able to do all this precisely because of the support of the United States and the UK. And most recently being the fact that the Ugandan army is deployed in Somalia. And that is a key aspect in the financial aid that it receives every almost $1 billion. And this has helped Museveni stay in power. He is, he is a dictator of strange characteristics. Uh, Ali Mari was pointing out how he even intervenes in uh, disputes between motorcycle driver unions or you know, uh, the most basic appointments and stuff like that. So this is a ruler who has basically completely taken over all the levers of power, all institutions in the country, even maybe broken the back of the trade unions as well. And then on the other hand, out of almost out of nowhere, but in fact, it's a process of over three years. There's a youth resurgence that takes place. And the face of this youth movement is Bobby Wine, a singer, who uh, starts out as a member of parliament, railing against some of these abuses. Very, again, very young, just 38 years old. And uh, what do you call it? Very powerfully representing. And Uganda is a country with a huge percentage of youth population. So uh, basically what this means is there's a huge, large amount of unemployment over there and the youth are really not willing to take it anymore. The elections took place yesterday. As was expected, initial results show Museveni leading by a considerable margin, which uh, nobody's surprised by. The day before the election, the internet was shut down uh, across the country again. Uh, and in the weeks before that, there were consistent attacks on Bobby Wine. In fact, even UN authorities raised concerns about it, his campaign staff were arrested, his rallies were attacked, he himself was arrested, and they nonetheless managed to uh, fight back against this. So uh, what's uh, happening right now is that uh, basically the results are still coming in. We're expecting the final results tomorrow. And uh, nonetheless, the key issue is that uh, I think what Alimari pointed out was the simple question was this. Will Museveni be willing to unleash that amount of violence to stay in power because uh, until now he would never face the possibility of this youth challenge, this massive number of young people coming onto the streets and it's a real possibility. So if they take to the streets, will he unleash all that violence? Will it cause bloodshed? Will it cause you know, uh, unfortunately maybe even deaths? Or will he understand that the voice, the, the people are right now, the, this is the sentiment of the people that he should leave and there's been no peaceful transfer of power. 
So it's a big, big question right now. Thoughts with the people of Uganda who have been fighting, who have been struggling right now, and next couple of days are going to be very, very crucial. Very interesting. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, the, when the result comes in, of course, I mean, I anticipate that uh, we're going to look toward um, uh, a result that looked familiar to us. On the other hand, I think the very fact that there's a serious uh, move by the government, uh, I mean, by, by the people to push against uh, this regime, I think is, is very significant. And let, let's see how this turns out. Uh, and because it, it may end up being in some ways a, a dress rehearsal for Zambia. Uh, it, it may be a dress rehearsal for the other elections that come. You know, if people's confidence rises that they don't have to follow um, the governments that are sanctified by the United States, let's see how it goes. I mean, earlier I said that um, Cuba um, has, um, you know, essentially um, been put back on the state sponsor on terrorism list. One of the reasons given is Venezuela. Of course, Venezuela turned around on the other side and decided to assist the people of Brazil. Uh, you know, uh, hasn't turned around and said, what's going on with the United States, whatever. Because, you know, there's a difference between a country that wants to smother countries and a country that wants to help other countries. Um, Zoe, I, I saw that the foreign minister of Venezuela, Jorge Ariadza, had sent a tweet out, and I was quite interested in that. Tell us a little bit about um, you know, what the Venezuelan government is doing regarding Brazil, which has taken a hostile position against the Venezuelan government. Yeah, I think um, so. Last night, uh, Jorge Ariasa tweeted that um, at the request of Nicolas Maduro, um, the Venezuelan government would be sending oxygen tanks to uh, the Brazilian state of Amazonas, uh, the capital of which is Manaus. And they're currently having a massive uh, public health crisis in the state. Um, there's, you know, a collapse of the public health system. Uh, they are running out of oxygen, ICU beds, um, the like. Uh, there's a massive surge in cases, double the numbers that they saw last week. Um, and so essentially the response of Venezuela, which is the neighboring country, I mean, the neighbors Amazonas was to say, uh, Latin American solidarity is more important. And that's exactly what Jorge Arias has said in his tweet. Um, despite, you know, the constant aggression from uh, the federal government of Brazil under Jair Bolsonaro, uh, the Venezuelan government decided to put solidarity and the cooperation between the people above that. Um, they were able to create an agreement with the state government um, and they're sending uh, oxygen tanks to support them to get through this humanitarian crisis, to get through this very crucial moment. Of course, we know that Brazil has been, has had the highest numbers um, in the region, just only behind the United States actually in the world and India in terms of cases, but only behind United States in terms of deaths. Um, you know, uh, horrible numbers, horrible numbers. The government has not done anything anything to control this. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro has even, you know, started to say that the vaccine, you know, is it, uh, you know, speaking against the vaccine has taken all possible measures to undermine efforts uh, to keep people in confinement, to take any sort of measures um, to support the public health system. And so this is the result. The result is that there's been, you know, the first wave never ended, but the second peak is definitely beginning. Um, and so in Manaus, you know, it's records numbers of deaths and confirmed cases. You know, there were some really striking images from Manaus in April, aerial images of the mass graves that were being dug um, to accommodate the number of people who had died because of COVID. It's truly a travesty, a humanitarian travesty. Um, and Venezuela, in the face of all this, Venezuela, of course, just to remind people, um, has had much less numbers of cases, um, just over 100,000 confirmed cases, just over 1,000 deaths. Unimaginable. I mean, here in the United States, we have 4,000 deaths a day from COVID. Um, so just to put that in perspective. Um, and so, you know, Venezuela has taken this humanitarian approach as it always does and put the lives of the people in front in over profit and even over diplomatic, uh, you know, hostile diplomatic relations from Brazil. I mean, talk about putting people before profit, you know, uh, there's been so little attention paid uh, to the question of the Palestinians, you know, people under occupation, what is COVID like for them? 
um, you know, uh, Israeli government who controls so many aspects of Palestinian life because of the occupation have been, I think, really uh, at a level of uh, we're open to great criticism for their management of, of, of COVID-19 in the occupied um, Palestinian territories. And then, of course, on top of that, um, the Trump administration, again, in the waning days, decided to basically say, well, you can build settlements. We are not going to criticize you. We don't see it as illegal, as if the U.S. government, you know, is the is the arbiter of international law, is the sovereign. You know, that's the attitude of the government. In fact, settlement building in the occupied Palestinian territories is illegal, according to U.N. resolutions, number of them. Situation is so bad that Beth Salem, you know, the human rights group uh, designated Israel as an apartheid state. You know, this was a term used by the United Nations Economic and Social Commission of West Asia in 2014 in a landmark report, which was widely criticized. Israeli government uh, approached the UN to remove the director, Rima Khalaf, uh, who was the director of Esquire at the time. Now, Beth Salem has used this term and says that this is the only way to designate Israel. Uh, 800 um, homes to be built, uh, homes for uh, Israelis to be built on Palestinian land. That's what Netanyahu promises a lame duck prime minister. He's facing another election on the 23rd of March, most likely 23rd of March. Um, I mean, this is just lawlessness, you know, whether it's the attitude towards China or Iran, Yemen, Cuba, Venezuela, Palestinians, there is utter lawlessness uh, on display. And sometimes, you know, one asks, wonders as a journalist, you know, where, where what is the basis on which one writes a story? You know, um, I, I would write a story on, on Israel based on the standards set by the UN Charter and the UN resolutions and so on, or on the, on the, 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 the sentiments of the Palestinian people. And, you know, that's the basis on which one writes a story. Um, the lawlessness of these powerful governments is something to behold. And, and I mean, it, it really, it beggars belief, guys, how poorly, or in fact, not, I was going to say poorly, it's reported. It's not reported very much at all. And again, it's a good thing. People's Dispatch has been covering this, has done stories on all these things that I just talked about. Uh, very much hope that you go to the website, bookmark the page. Before we leave you today, it's important to invite you on Monday, the 18th of January at 6.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time at 10 a.m. Brazil time. And then you have to use your mathematical skills to figure out uh, what time it is in your time zone. Um, 6.30 p.m. India time, 10 a.m. Brazil time. P. Sainath, the very great Indian journalist, will be uh, giving us a presentation. This is for People's Dispatch and Globetrotter, essentially for give the people what they want. Uh, he will be talking about journalism um, as the act of reporting on the great processes of our time. Very hope, uh, very much hope that you'll join us because he's not only a dear friend, but he's in many ways our teacher and leader in terms of how to struggle to be better journalists. You know, journalism isn't just something you you get a, a ticket on. You spend your life trying to be a better reporter. We hope you get a sense of our struggle to be better reporters um, during our show. Give the people what they want. Come to you every Friday um, at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time um, and at whatever other time zone you're uh, watching or listening. We're also, of course, a podcast all the platforms um, very much hope that you'd listen to us and also now available on youtube um, prashant zoe from people's dispatch i'm vijay from globetrotter we'll see you next week thanks a lot